والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are in the very beginning of the fourth year of Hijra The set was the Muslims were semi defeated in the battle of Uhud and all their enemies were encouraged to attack them as they thought they were a weak prey to be attacked. In the very beginning of the fourth year, in the month of Muharram, the Prophet ﷺ, through his reconnaissance team, knew that tribes from Bani Al-Asad are trying to invade Medina, led by Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid and his brother Salama ibn Khuwaylid. So he sent to them Abu Salama al-Makhzumi, his great companion, and his brother in suckling. And he gave him a flag, tell him to go and fight to the la in the land of Bani Asad and to invade them. So he went with his companions until he reached that area, their tribe. And as he went in, they were taken by surprise. So they fled their homes and lands as usual, terrorized by the Muslim and they left their camels and sheep which Abu Salama took with him. May Allah be pleased with him. He stayed there for 10 days, hoping that they may, might come back and feel men enough to fight him, but they didn't. What about the number of the army? Well, it wasn't a very big expedition, but it was fair because if you go within 50 or 100 of them, this would no. suffice. Afterwards, there was also in the same month of Muharram, of the fourth year, a military expedition. But this military expedition was composed of only one single man. And this man was Abdullah ibn Unais, one of the brave warriors of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ called him and he came and he told him, I'd like you to go and travel to Arafah, and particularly in the valley of Urana. There you'll find a man by the name of Khalid ibn Sufyan al-Hudhali. He is gathering the tribes in that area so that they can come and attack us in Medina. So go to him and kill him. And Abdullah did not object, did not question the Prophet ﷺ by saying, you want me to go and attack a full army? This is strange. He did not ask him, but he had only one concern. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, I've never met this Khalid ibn Sufyan, so how would I recognize him? The Prophet told him that the minute you see him, you will feel the shiver in your body. So he went. He traveled for two to, f to four or five days because from Medina to Mecca it's about three day okay. journey of course now by airplane it's one Maybe hour yeah. it's, it's about 400 plus 
uh, kilometers. kilometers. So by car, usually from Mecca to Medina, it's about five hour journey. On camelback or uh, if you're walking, then it's far uh, uh, longer. He went until he reached that area and it was Asr time. The story tells us that he said, as I was walking, I was afraid that I may miss Asr prayer. So I prayed while walking and bowed and semi-prostrated while also walking until I've finished my Asr prayer. And this indicates to us that even if you are on a sacred mission, even if you are at the cause of Allah, don't mess with prayer. Some of us may think that, okay, if we are in a lecture, if we are doing a program, it's okay for us to postpone prayer until the other prayer comes because we are, are on a just cause. This is unacceptable. You as an individual, your priority is to pray on time. Some people said that if I'm in work, that means I'm worship Allah. What do you think about this? Well, this has a right to it and a wrong. The wrong part of it would be to justify any sin or anything that is bad that will be a result of your work. So they say, as long as you're working, and this is a form of worship of, to Allah, then it's okay to postpone prayer. It's okay to uh, uh, work with females. It's okay to cheat because this is at the side of Allah and this is unacceptable. The, the, the right part of it would be that if your cause is to get money that would save you and suffice you from begging people and that would be enough to feed your family and to clothe them and to give them a decent life, then yes, this is a form of worship, but it is not at all close to prayer. So if your job means that you have to postpone or delay prayers, then you have to look for another job. Regardless, because essentially you have to pray on time, no matter what happens. Going back to our story, Abdullah ibn Unais, may Allah be pleased with him, went to this man, Khalid ibn Sufyan. And Khalid ibn Sufyan looked at him and testing him. What do you want? Abdullah ibn Unais is not afraid. So he has what they call nowadays a poker face. Nothing could change in his face. He just looked him in the eyes and said, I heard that you're gathering to fight that man. He didn't even, know, he didn't even name him as form of humiliation and, 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 and he's not even paying any attention to, to show him that he's not a Muslim. I heard that you're gathering people to fight, to fight that man and I wanted to be with you. So he said, okay, sit down. He sat down with him for a while and Abdullah ibn Unais had stories and poetry and they chit-chatted for a while, an hour or two, until the guy was feeling secure and liking this stranger because I, I like the way he talks. And just before sunset, Abdullah ibn Anais told him, what about if we, you know, walk around? I'm, I'm tired of sitting. So Khalid said, yes, why not? And they walked around together until they were away from the camp and behind one of the hills and then he jumped on him and he chopped his head off. And immediately he went back to Medina. And he went back to, the, to Medina and gave the glad tidings to the Prophet ﷺ that your enemy is no more existing. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him and asked Allah Azzawajal for him for forgiveness. And not only that, he gave him, the Prophet ﷺ, a, a branch, a stick. So he took it and went and then he came back to the Prophet. Oh, Prophet of Allah, why did you give me the stick with? What to do with it? It's just a stick. I have swords, I have everything. The Prophet told him that on the day of judgment, those who have sticks with them are very few. And I want you to be among those very few. The stick is a form of prestige, you know, to point at. It's not something that you fight with or to, it's not a cane. It's just something to have in your hand. And Abdullah ibn Unais 
put it in the, his will that whenever he dies, it should be put alongside of him in the grave. And so they did. I heard, Sheikh, that the Prophet ﷺ had to use a stick with him. No, this is not correct. The Prophet ﷺ did not use a stick with him, though he was quite old. He was 56 at the time, 55, 56 years old. But he sometimes had what is called as a anaza, and it's a short spear. And he sometimes used to carry it in order to use it. But he did not have a cane with him. He would sometimes uh, uh, deliver the Friday speech and having a spear like uh, uh, with him or a stick so that he could uh, 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 deliver the, the khutbah and, and the oration of, of uh, Friday. But it was not a cane that he used to use to walk with. The following month was a tragic month also for the Muslims. It was the month of Safar, the second month in the Islamic calendar. The Prophet ﷺ sent six of his companions, and other stories say that he sent ten, with a group from Adul and Qara tribes, came to the Prophet, an, an, an envoy came to the Prophet, asking him to teach them about Islam. He introduced Islam to them. So they asked him to send people from his companions to teach their people. So he sent with them 10 of his companions with a double mission. One was to teach these tribes. Second, to look for information about what Quraysh is preparing and doing. So these companions of the Prophet ﷺ went with these men and in the way they did not know that Adl and Qara had an agreement with the tribe of Hudayl whom their leader was assassinated a few weeks earlier by Abdullah ibn Unais Khalid ibn Sufayn al hudari his tribe arranged to rent these people from the tribes of Adl and Qara so, to, so that they can draw some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and they can kill them in exchange. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we will be back. <laughs> So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Adul and Qara, the two, the envoy of these two tribes, came to the Prophet والسلام, pretending that they are accepting Islam, requesting him to send few of his companions to teach them about Islam. And so did the Prophet, والسلام, knowing the risks, because he knew that there is a risk always when you send a small number of your companions with complete strangers. But the Prophet ﷺ, for the sake of Allah, he had to take the chance in order to spread the word of Allah Azzawajal. He sent 10 with these people and he made a leader to them, Asim ibn Thabit ibn Abi al-Akhlah. May Allah be pleased with him. They used to travel at night and camp at daytime so that no one would feel of their presence. And in the middle of the way, near an area called al rajir and this expedition is known as the expedition of Rajir, 
they were surprised to find a hundred and some narrations say two hundred men from Hudayl waiting for them and they were all archers. They, did, they were not brave enough to fight with swords. So they surrounded them and tried to calm the Muslims by saying, we mean no harm to you. It's just that we have to take you prisoners and then give you to someone else. That's all. We don't want to kill you. Seven of the companions would not adhere to them. And their leader was Asim ibn Thabit. May Allah be pleased with him. What they did not know that the people in, Qur in Quraysh wanted to, to lay their hands on some of the Muslims so that they can execute in exchange for their loved ones that died in Badr. And also the tribe of Hudayl wanted to avenge the blood of, her, of their leader who died a few weeks ago, Khalid ibn Sufyan al-Hudali. And also there was a price on the head of Asim ibn Thabit. And why was that? Asim ibn Thabit ibn Abi al-Aqlah was one of the strongest warriors of Islam. And he was an excellent archer. And if you recall in the battle of Uhud, 10 of the people who carried the flag were all, all from Banu Abd al-Dar. And six, the first six to die of them were all brothers, the sons of Abu Talha, beginning with Talha ibn Abi Talha, Uthman ibn Abi Talha, and Sa'ad, and so on. And two of these were killed by Asim ibn Thabit ibn Abi al-Aqlah. When he killed them, before killing them, he would say, take it, and I am the son of Ibn Abi al-Aqlah. So, as they were dying, their mother came to them in the battlefield and asked them, who did this to you? And both of them said, a man by the name of Ibn Abi al-Aqlah. So, she took a vow on herself that I want this man dead and I want to drink wine in his skull. So he want, she wanted his head and she wanted to drink wine in his skull. So she put a price, a very high price on his head. And the traders, the polytheists, were happy to know that he was the leader because this meant that they were going to make a lot of money. Seven of the companions would not adhere to them, would not surrender. And they fought until they died. One of them was Asim bin Thabit. Yeah. Now, a funny thing and, and, and a very amazing thing about Asim ibn Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him, was that he, when he gave the pledge of allegiance to the Prophet وسلم, and shook hands with him, he said, O Prophet of Allah, this hand, that shook with your hand, I will not touch a disbeliever with it, and no disbeliever will ever touch me. And this just to show how far away from disbelief he was, to the extent that even physical contact he would not allow. And of course, as we know, it's okay for Muslims to shake hands with non-Muslims and to sit with them and to eat with them, but with Asim, it was a different story because he was so far away from them and he would not ever sit alongside with them because they insult Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is his way. It's up to him if he doesn't want to shake hands with anyone. It's his choice. So no one could say, well, this is extreme or this is too much. No, it's not. If I don't want to sit with a particular person or shake hands with, it's, it's my own freedom to to do and choose whatever I want. Therefore, as they were killing him, he supplicated to Allah and said, O oh Allah, inform our Prophet وسلم, with what's taking place with us. Tell him what's, what's happening. And O oh Allah, as I protected your religion 
at the beginning of the day, protect my body at the end of the day. Because he still did not want them to touch his body. As they killed him, they wanted to go and behead him so that they can take his head to Sulafa, this woman who had a price on his head. So, as soon as they killed him, they went down to cut his head off. But Allah Azza wa Jal sent swaps and the bees and surrounded his body. And they could not Touch get him. close to him. So they said, it's okay. We wait until sunset. And then we can be able to do this. And as soon as the sun set, subhanallah, Allah sent a flood of water coming and swept his body until this day no one knows where his body is. And Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is what Umar ibn Khattab uh, uh, said, Subhanallah, Allah the Almighty protects those who protect his religion. I heard that uh, there's a verse in Quran uh, came down, got revealed from Allah about that particular person that he that Allah said from the believers, men, uh, which they were honest or they fulfilled their promise or the pledge with Allah. So is it for that uh, particular companion? It, it can fit him, but as we were told by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this, this verse from Surah Al-Ahzab is also applicable to Talha ibn Ubaidillah. May Allah be pleased with him, who defended the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bravely on the Battle of Uhud. Min al-Rijali, min al-Mu'minin al-Rijalun, ahadullah. Among the believers, there are men who uh, gave their vows and, 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 and pledged to uh, uh, support Allah Azza wa and His Messenger. He said that Talha ibn Ubaidillah is among them. But this also applies to all companions and all believers who are uh, uh, sincere, honest, and truthful in their belief. Now, as we said, seven died. Three surrendered because they had the choice whether to die or to surrender. Now, it's up to you also in similar situations that if a person is under fire and he is sure that he has no escape, so he has the right to surrender and he has also the right to fight until he dies. And this okay. happened with Asim bin Thabit, he chose to die. And this happened with uh, uh, the companions of the Prophet والسلام, who gave in. And those were uh, Khubayb ibn Adi, Zayd ibn Dithinna, and Abdullah ibn Tariq. And as soon as they threw their, uh, uh, their weapons, they were approached by the disbelievers who wanted to tie them. Abdullah ibn Tariq thought that this is the beginning of the treason. So he took his sword and he fought with them until he was killed. Khubayb ibn Adi and Zayd ibn Dithinna, they were sold to people in Mecca. And uh, uh, Khubayb was sold to the family of Al-Harith ibn Amr, who himself, he killed him in the Battle of Badr. So his family wanted to avenge their father by killing Khubayb ibn Adi. And Zayd ibn Dathinna was bought by Safwan ibn Umayyah, whose father also was killed in the Battle of Badr, and he wanted to kill one of the Muslims in his place. Khubayb, may Allah be pleased with him, had a strange story. He was given to the family of Al-Harith ibn Amr, and he was kept there as a prisoner. And he stayed there. And just before he was executed, he requested a blade so that he could shave the private parts. Uh, uh, as in Islam, it's called istihdad. In Islam, it is part of nature to remove the pubic hair and to re remove the underpit uh, uh, hair. So he requested this blade, though he was about to die, yet following the sunnah and complying with nature mm -hmm. is something that was in all the companions of the Prophet Even just before he died, 
he knew that he had to clean himself. So one of the ladies in that house gave him this blade. And as he took the blade, she did not notice that one of her children went into the prison cell. And he was sitting on Khubayb's leg. You know, it's a small child. And the blade was in the other hand. And the woman was terrified. So he looked at her and he said, Are you afraid? Are you afraid that I might kill him? Don't be. And he gave her the child in peace. Which again teaches us that Muslims don't have this revenge and hatred in them. Because if I knew that someone is going to kill me in a matter of hours, and I had a chance to kill any one of his loved ones, I would have done that. Islam does not permit that. And it's not as well like it's not barbaric, you know, actions or something to kill innocents or children or women. I think it was a good ex example for you know non-Muslims to know that the real Islam or the companions, they know whom uh, they are allowed to kill and whom they are not. Of course, they were told not to attack and not to harm children, women, and the elderly. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.